to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on topics ranging from Jewish history and the Bible to Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. To find out about David's talks, books, and more, visit davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. What I want to do in this course is uh, this four lecture series is pretty much what the title said it's mystical encounters with the divine and that as you can imagine is a very broad topic within Judaism that's been going for 4,000 years and as you can imagine uh, about a week ago I'm freaking out about how exactly I'm going to approach this and it's really more about what I leave out than what I put in and I want to focus on things that can enable us to get an understanding of what mysticism is and how that has influenced Jewish thought over many years and what elements of it are still with us and where it is going. In the course of that discussion, I think that we will uncover some very, very obscure and interesting topics that are only obscure to us because people don't really talk about them but except at certain scholarly levels but they do exist so I'm going to open up aspects of Jewish thought to you that may not be overly familiar to you and I want to tell you from the outset that in doing so I'm not plucking this stuff out of whatever body part I choose to I'm going to try and represent some of the most cutting-edge scholarship in this field uh, and where it's at. But in order to do that, we have to talk about the basics, and the basics are things that even people are not even aware of. I'm going, I'm serious. I'm going to talk about things in this course that will challenge our traditional understanding of Jewish thought and philosophy and approach to the world. There are some things that I will discuss and you will look at me and you'll go, that's impossible, that's not Judaism, I never heard of that. And if we achieve that, then we will have achieved the aim of this course because it's all very mystical. But there are elements within Jewish experience and Jewish discussion that go through cycles of obscurity and then come into the fore as they get revived and they get developed and then they go into abeyance for a few centuries and then they come back out and that's one of the things that we're going to look at this afternoon first of all I want to deal with the with the basic fundamental question of oh and I've, 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 I've there are some very very broad notes about what I hope we'll talk about that I'll hand out at the end just so that you can have some memo of what we talked about in rough terms. But I have no problem with you taking your own notes. Your own notes will be better. But don't clench your sphincter and think, oh, I won't know anything about what he talked about, because there will be some broad guidelines at the end. And I've also unusually got some other handouts, textual handouts. And I'm going to hand these notes out and they are texts and we're going to so you're actually going to have to read a little bit and discuss so it's a little workshoppy all right but that will all be that will all be clear at the time that I do it very unusual for me what is mysticism and as you know people have been struggling with the definition of that for a long time they all seem, all definitions and discussions of what mysticism actually is, and mysticism, a mystical outlook or a mystical approach is somewhat different from a religious approach. Religion tends to be uh, aligned with the fundamental institutions of any faith and spiritual system. When we make, when we make broad, radical statements like religion is about power or religion is about control all the things that we hear around Friday night dinner tables as people justify why they're not religious those are definitions that adhere to the main outward structures of religion and religions aren't always all about control and authority they are about very structured ritualized systems but they are open they're on the surface and 
if you're going to become a Muslim, it's very clear what you need to do. If you're going to become a Christian, it's clear what you need to do. And if you want to become Jewish, it's certainly clear, for the most part, what you need to do. It's never clear what you need to do. But you know what I mean. Mysticism, however, boils down to the idea that there is behind this reality another deeper and perhaps more authentic and truer reality that a person can, a human being with the right kind of attitude and approach and preparation can have access to, can be exposed to, can be, that, that reality can be revealed to them and that they can even spend most of their time there. And in that reality, things are as they truly are. It provides the person who accesses it with an experiential dimension that's very hard to, to transmit to someone who doesn't undergo the same experience, and therefore it's mysterious and it's mystical, it's experiential, it's felt. You know, when we talk about things like a feeling of bliss, a feeling of oneness, a feeling of uh, at, 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 at home with all of reality, all of those things that we hear about, that's experiential, but it also reveals to a person a level of knowledge, a level of enlightenment about what's really going on. And people who access the mystical look to that real and alternate reality as the essential reality and this one as the illusion, this one is simply the byproduct of what is really the intent in the mystical world. These things, these are the two aspects that seem to be in common with mysticism. But in all events, in all events, it is um, an adherence to the idea that there is another alternate reality that we can glimpse. There is a quote I found, I mean, in many, many readings of books, all books on mysticism start with this question, what is mysticism? And, the, and none of them really, really satisfactorily answer it, but I did find a beautiful quote in a book written uh, well over a century ago by a guy called Abelson, called Jewish Mysticism. And I wrote down this quote, and I really, really like it. He says, the quest for ultimate reality, and this is very, very much in theme with what I want to discuss with you today, with what I want to open up for you today. The quest for ultimate reality is a kind of pilgrimage. And the seeker is a traveler towards his home in God. That is really summing up the mystical yearning to go to a place where things are more true, things are more real, things are more beautiful, Things are as they really are, and at the core of that is the great pulsating divine that we can access. The kind of thing that we hear also happens to souls after death, but that that kind of experience can be had during one's lifetime. And that, of course, would involve two possible ways in which that could happen. And this is what we need to understand. There are what we call theophanies. I'm going to use these terms, so I'm laying them out at the beginning. Theophanies. Anyone know what a theophany is? It's a very impressive sounding word. Use that word at your Shabbos table, you'll do well. I had a theophany. What is theophanic? What is a theophany? No, well, first of all, the word theo in there is already telling you something to do with God. A theophany is a revelation. It is the appearance of God. So you're walking around uh, Chadston and uh, suddenly <laughs> God appears. That, as you do, right? As happens. That's a theophany. The other way in which we might describe mystical uh, experience is by ascension. That is not where God comes and appears to you, but you go and travel and find yourself where God is. So we have theophanies and we have ascensions. And what we find is that those two types are really the, 
the main axis of what happens over the course of Jewish thought in relation to in direct encounters with the divine. I'm going to be talking in this course mostly about direct encounters with mystical experience and with divine realities. Now, so the first place we look when we think about Jewish thoughts and we want to get our head around uh, that particular type of journey over the last few thousand years within the Jewish continuum and where that has been expressed and how that has been developed, where's the first place that we would look? The Torah. The Torah. Yeah. Every intellectual or any other journey in Jewish thought always begins with the Torah. If it can't be linked back to that in some way, then you're probably dealing with something else. And in the Torah, not just the Torah, but let's talk about the Tanakh. Let's talk about the whole Bible. Yeah. So where well, let's let's open this up to feedback, um, and let's workshop it. Where in the Bible, for example, would we have examples of theophanies or ascensions? So where's an example of where God appears? Now there are the Bible. Yeah. Well, perfect, perfect, perfect. There are quite a number. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, in the Bible, it's difficult um, to go all the way through because the Bible, I mean, every second page, someone's having a discussion with God or an encounter with God or God speaking to someone. But what I want to focus on right now, of course, is the mystical, the where something, I mean, when Abraham talks to God, for example, it seems kind of ordinary. Obviously, it wasn't ordinary, but it seems that within the context of the narrative, you know, Abraham's standing there, God says to him, I'm going to destroy Sodom, or I want you to sacrifice your son, or I want you to go to a land I will show you. These things are conversational and almost banal. They're not out of the ordinary. What is out of the ordinary in terms of the appearance of God? It's like... <clears throat> so we have... Obviously, you mentioned the burning bush. That's an outstanding example. The big, the great big theophany that is always looked at, is considered the, the theophanic experience par excellence, is of course... No, well, there's no one around to see creation. The revelation at Sinai, because that was a revelation of the divine to the entire nation on a level that we are told by the sages of Israel that no revelation has really exceeded that one. In fact, that relation was so intense that the entire nation couldn't handle it and they sent Moses up the mountain to do it for them. I don't know if you're aware of that, but according to Midrash, all Midrashic lines and the sages of Israel, we only heard directly the first two commandments. The next ones we just just couldn't, couldn't deal with it. But there are throughout the Bible various other astonishing appearances. And when we look particularly at the prophets of Israel, this is beyond the Pentateuch, beyond the Chumash, when we look at the rest of the Bible, we see people who have direct visions of God. Notably, Daniel has dreams. He doesn't see the divine or an apparition. You know what? He does, he does. At one level, he does, because he sees Atik Yomin sitting uh, up there, but in a dream. That's good. Okay, Daniel. Daniel is an interesting one. We might revisit Daniel. Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a very, very famous one. The most famous one, probably. Isaiah, chapter 6. Something that people don't realize. Isaiah has a vision of the divine. And some of the other prophets have these kinds of vision. In Hebrew, the word... We have, obviously, the word for prophecy is what? Nevoah. 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 Nevoah is prophecy. But the word for vision, the word for prophetic vision is what? Anyone know? When I tell you, you'll go, oh, yes, that's right. Who, who, who in the room has a shtickle Hebrew? I'm not asking for a professor of Hebrew language at Tel Aviv University. I'm asking for just a shtickle. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Good. So the word that we use for vision, 
and I'm writing this, obviously I'm transliterating it for you, is chizayon. That's a, that's a chet. Chizayon. So sometimes a prophet is not merely a navi, but also a chose. That is, they have visions. Okay, so we have a number of different theophanies going on in the Bible. I was going to spend quite a bit of time on the Bible, but I'm not going to do it because the Bible acts as kind of like a foundational document, and I want to show how that gets built on. But we will, throughout this course, keep coming back to these prophetic paradigms of vision. What about ascent? So the famous, most famous ascent is Elijah. But Elijah ascends at the end of his life and career. Well, not at the end of his life because he doesn't die technically. But at the end of his career, Elijah is taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. This is very, very important. This is very, very important. If you're a mystic and you're reading the Bible and you read that, you're going to go, wow, I want a bit of that. Where can I do that? How can I do that? Right? So, we always must remember that the Bible, the Torah, and the rest of the Tanakh are the experiences par excellence that the mystics of Israel have always come back to to take their fundamental um, understanding of how the ultimate reality, mystic, the ultimate mystical reality is, uh, is, is accessed. And once again, this definition of mysticism, we will keep having to come back to it. All right? I'm very happy for anybody in this group to go away and come back next week and go, oh, I found a good definition of mysticism. All right? Because we'll incorporate it. So, I've got a question. How do we distinguish then between the conversations of Noah I think at the, that's a good question and I think at the end of the day apart from just literary intuition about what seems ordinary and what doesn't within so many of those conversations God's just another person they're having a conversation with yeah, versus the effect that it has on either the person experiencing the revelation or the onlookers when you look at Elijah yeah, who was watching that? His, who was watching that was his main protege and acolyte and successor in the prophecy who was Elisha and when Elisha saw this he was absolutely completely this is Elisha who is not someone who's unused to supernatural experiences he saw miracles happen every day he even was doing miracles himself but when he saw that he was completely and absolutely spun out and overwhelmed right Torah even the Tanakh even says Sefer Malachim says he was spun out now <laughs> so we have on the one hand we have the effect but not just the effect on the on, on, on the viewer what happened to Ezekiel when the chariot appeared to Ezekiel what did he do dude standing by the river in the river Kabar in Babylon. Looks up, the clouds part, there's the divine chariot. What does he do? It's immediately on his face. Like we're talking like overwhelming. So maybe that's one difference that we can look at. What did he do, sir? He, he, well, you'll read it in a second. He completely collapsed. Now, so maybe, but that's not a, that's not a complete way of distinction between them. Now, I, want to, I, I, I just want to broadly introduce those issues for you because we're going to revisit them. What is mysticism? How do we define those distinctions? Yeah? And one of the issues that we have in picking the particularly mystical episodes from the Bible because everybody's talking to God and God's talking to everybody. Yeah? And it's not seen as particularly unusual that someone is told something by God. There is one other element I want to bring in at this point when we look at theophanies and ascensions, God's coming and appearing to us, or we are sending and looking at God, 
Although, as I said, the, the paradigm for that, Elijah, all we know is he's taken up. We don't actually know what happens to him after that. The other element that we want to introduce here, because it's going to be important in the context of today's discussion and going forward, is angels. Angels. Angelic revelation. Because there's no question that angels have evolved in Jewish thought in a variety of ways and are an important part of what we talk about when we talk about mystical encounters with the divine. We know, and you know, that there's a problem with encountering and seeing the divine. What's the problem? You can't see God, and God says in the Bible itself, Lo yirani ha'adam v'chai. No human can look at me and live. Yeah? So, what's this business of people hanging and walking along? Oh, there was God, had a coffee with him. Well, what does that mean? Well, so, the sages of Israel, obviously, in many, many cases, talk about how these mystical encounters were actually via angels that were clearly of a divine nature. They weren't God in essential. They were messengers of God, but they were divine messengers of God. So they were, in many ways, an authentication of that mystical reality. Yeah? But we still have this tension. We still have this tension inside Jewish thought that we have very, very explicit encounters with the divine. Not just in the Bible. Not just in the Bible, but right through Talmudic literature as well and beyond. Now... How does this all devolve down in practice? Because once we have an introduction, I want to actually get a shtickle historical here. And I want to start looking at what is, what, what is the first great manifestation of this that we're aware of in practice. It's very hard for us to access what was going on in Jewish culture beyond the documents that we have prior to, prior to the Second Temple period. In other words, the period of the Bible, we have the biblical text that takes us up, say, to the Babylonian exile. And everybody, anybody who's done any history with me should have some awareness of when that was. When was the Babylonian exile? Which century would that have happened in? Very good. So we're talking about the 6th century BCE. BCE. So about 2,500 years ago. So that's where the Bible brings us up to. And it's difficult for us to access the inner practical experience that's happening during that time. And even beyond that, in the early Second Temple period, we're kind of getting a, 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 a hazy only idea of what might have been happening. And things don't start to, start to take on shape and detail of inner practical life that is evolving into what we recognize as Judaism until the second or third century BCE. And really, once we start getting after the first and second century CE is when we start getting an understanding of maybe some of the inner cultural dynamics and the way people actually lived and the way they practiced and what they actually did. Yeah? So when we talk about the first kind of movement in Jewish mysticism... We're talking about something that is comparatively late. Yep, not late in terms of any other religion on the planet, but comparatively late in terms of Jewish thought because we're already at the end of the Second Temple period by the time we get a window on what is actually happening on a practical level. Everybody follow? Yeah. Now, what is happening is that Jewish mystical thinking... I know that some of you will have been told by various different elements that the Kabbalah as we know it has been around forever. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, well, it's not heretical to say that the Kabbalah is an evolving and developing uh, body of thought that contains revelations that have been happening since the year dot until today but Kabbalah as we know it now and as we've known it for the last say seven eight hundred years 
is not apparent to us in that there are earlier forms of Jewish mysticism that took on an entirely different mode of a thought and experience. And I want to paint just you the picture of what Jewish mystical thinking looked like at the end of the Second Temple period and for the few centuries beyond that. And that evolves out of Torah study. As you know, the shift within Jewish culture away from a temple-centric spiritual system towards uh, a more faith and text-based system as we went into exile, as we lost autonomy in the land of Israel, as the Jewish people underwent a number of severe oppressions and persecutions in the early centuries of the common era. These fundamentally altered the kind of cultural emphases, plus even towards the end of the Second Temple, while we still had the Temple, our encounter with Hellenic culture gave us a far greater emphasis on the systematization of texts, and that's why by the end of the second century, you're all, we're already producing a document called the Mishnah, which is the entire oral law tradition written down, systematized in succinct form. And the sages of the Mishnah, the Tanaim, place the study of Torah at the center of any curriculum, at the center of their world, at the center of their entire thought. And therefore, every single section of the Bible has a mystical teachings, not mystical, but has extensive teachings connected with it. And that includes, why is oh, And that includes the mystical sections of the Bible. In other words, you might be studying... We might, oh, I might come in today because this is our Torah Academy in the Tanaitic and early Amoraic period. Yeah? I'm the great sadhu, guru, rabbi. You're all the acolytes. I sit down, probably on a rock. You're sitting on the floor. And I go, okay, in either Palestine or Babylonia. And I go, today we are going to study the section of what happens when... Uh, a cow, a bull gores someone else's cow. All right? This is the Torah. This is what happens. And we will learn all the laws about that and all the compensations and all the different cases. And you'll ask me questions. And through that, we'll clarify the law and the halakha. And I'm going to give over everything that I've heard from my teachers. And you're, I'm going to tell you the principles. And then you're going to bring cases. We're going to look at that. This is how the Mishnah developed. And this is how the, ultimately the whole Talmud developed. <coughs> But every once in a while, I might want to talk about the traditions associated with other less legal texts and more theological and theosophical texts. And once every, in an absolute blue moon, to only the most highest level adept students, will I say, I'm now going to be teaching... the texts of that I'm only allowed to teach and there, there are guidelines in the Mishnah for these when these texts are going to be short only to one or two students at a time and over the course of this mode of teaching two biblical texts emerged as the foundation of all subsequent Jewish mysticism this is before the Kabbalah evolves and Sfirot and all these other things. The passed on traditions to do with these two chapters, that obviously I'm about to tell you which two chapters they are, these two chapters emerged as the foundations of all Jewish mystical thinking. Not all, but most. And what two chapters of the Bible do you think they are? I'll tell you. And we're going to read them. I'm going to, I've got copies of them. So I want to pass them so you can each have copies of them. And we're going to spend a couple of minutes and we're going to look at them. Yep. One chapter. One chapter is Genesis 1. 
which became known as the teachings of Maaseh Breshit, the act of creation. The act of creation formed the foundation of Jewish cosmology, that is the study of the universe. In fact, even much, much later, when you have a medieval figure like Maimonides is telling you, Maaseh Breshit is in effect science. What is nature? How are things created? And so on. That's Maaseh Bereshit, which had its own secret and mystical teaching that could only be passed down to adepts. But you could at least teach Maaseh Bereshit maybe to one or two at a time. But the other chapter could only be taught either to one, only to one student and only when they were basically mature enough to understand by themselves. And that is the first chapter of Ezekiel. Remember that the book of Ezekiel was controversial and when the rabbis of the second century were deciding on what is in and outside the Jewish canon there was a debate on Ezekiel there were debate on two books one was Ezekiel the other was Song of Songs and they both it was Rabbi Akiva who came along and said the whole of the Bible is holy and the Song of Songs is the holy of holies and it stayed in the canon. And Ezekiel was only accepted when the sages had resolved many of the bizarre contradictions that appears to have with the rest of the Bible. And of course, it's radical, it's radical theophany. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pass these around. Yep. So Ezekiel's text is known as Ma'aseh Merkava, the workings of the chariot. And that becomes the foundational text for all theosophical speculation. That is, what is actually going on in the divine realm. What you see is the text, but what accompanied that in oral teaching, what accompanied that in oral teaching was the true secrets. The two secrets, true secrets, not only of what this meant, but of how that world was accessed. This became then the basis of Merkava mysticism. And the main, main thing I'm going to be talking about today is Merkava mysticism. What I want you to do is I want you to spend two minutes because what is even more important than text when we study text? Context. Context is not more important than text, but it, when we, when we, once we have the text, we need context. The reason I'm giving you both of these chapters is, one, because these chapters form the foundation of all subsequent Jewish mystical thinking. But because I want you to look at these two chapters, which should be familiar to some of you. Certainly Genesis 1 will be familiar to most of you. Ezekiel 1, perhaps a little less so. And I want you to spend two minutes looking at them and seeing where you can find in them some interesting correspondences between Genesis 1 and Ezekiel 1. Remember that Genesis is... That's describing the beginning of the universe. And Ezekiel is historically placed in Babylon at the beginning of the exile following the destruction of the temple at the beginning of the 6th century BCE. But where are the correspondences between them? Can you see any? The big one I wanted to show you, there are a few others, but the big one I wanted to show you was um, obviously, obviously, um, verse 26 in Genesis. Go to verse 26 in Genesis and, yep, someone read out that translation for me. Let us make man in our image of our likeness, and they shall rule over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the heavens, and over the animals, and over the earth, and over all the creeping things that creep upon the earth. Right. Now, someone read me Ezekiel 126. And above the expanse that was over their heads, like the appearance of a sapphire stone, was the likeness of the throne. And on the likeness of the throne was a likeness like the appearance of a man upon his throne. Adam appears suddenly in verse 26 of Genesis 1 and suddenly in verse 26 of Ezekiel 1 there's Adam hasn't been mentioned before Adam, a form of Adam sitting on the 
divine throne. So already some of these correspondences were being worked into the mystical relationship between the two. But for the most part, these texts were kept separate. There were separate teachings on Maase Bereshit and separate teachings on Maase Merkava. Maase Bereshit was seen as esoteric and you had to be a scholar to engage with it, but they were not seen as dangerous. Ezekiel 1 is a text that was always perceived by Jewish mystics as dangerous. Dangerous to study because if you got the wrong apprehension, the consequences were not merely spiritual, they could be physical. Have a look, if you look at the, have a look, it's extremely interesting, but have a look at verse 4. This is, uh, this is Rosenberg's translation, but I, I, I from Judaica Press Tanakh, but um, uh, most translators also uh, struggle with this, right? Verse 4. Which one? Ezekiel. I'm talking about the dangers of Ezekiel now. Okay. Yeah? yeah? And I saw and behold a tempest was coming from the north, a huge cloud and a flaming fire with a brightness around it. And from its midst, it was like the color of the chashmal from the midst of the fire. In the Hebrew, umitocha ke'ena chashmal mitochaesh. What is the meaning of the word chashmal? When Eliezer ben Yehuda, at the beginning of the 20th century, was, who was reviving the Hebrew language, was looking for a word for electricity, he went to hear. And that's why in some translations, Chashmal is translated as electrum. But as the sages of the Talmud and everywhere else where Ezekiel 1 is discussed will tell you, we don't really sure what Chashmal means. The most brilliant translation I saw of it was by Arya Kaplan, who takes the Talmudic or the Zoharic idea that it's trend, and it, Chashmal is composed of Chash, meaning silent, and Mal, meaning speak, and talks about it's the, the, the speaking silence. But we have some idea of some very, very bright and powerful energy that surrounds the divine apparatus. It could be that electrum is a very, very appropriate translation and that chashmal is a type of electricity, but certainly it works today. Everybody thinks of chashmal, electricity, because that's become the modern Hebrew word. But it actually, we don't know what it means in the context of Tanakh. And that's why Elias ben Yehuda chose that word. Now, in the Talmud, it, re it relates a story about a young child that was reading the book of Ezekiel and reading chapter 1. And because this child was innocent and clever, he had a sudden apprehension of what the Chashmal is. All the great sages of Israel didn't know, and this child suddenly realized what it is. And at the moment of the child's realization, the Chashmal literally jumped out of the page and zapped him, electrocuted him. Another reason why it was chosen for the word for electricity, because when you read that story in the Talmud, it's exactly what it looks like. He got zapped, he got electrocuted by the text, and he died. This is one of the reasons why the sages said it's a dangerous text. It's dangerous because you might accidentally understand it. Which is astonishing. Yes. <laughs> And another account in a completely different place in the town, that's in Masechet Chagig and Masechet Shabbat, they talk about a case where a rabbi in Babylonia, of the sort that I was describing before, said, turned up one day and said, today I'm going to be lecturing on the Maase Merkava. Just like that, to a group of students who rock up at a Monday lunchtime at the museum. I'm going to lecture on the Merkava. This is why I have to be very careful about lecturing on the Merkava. And immediately a wasp came out from a hole in the wall, stung him and killed him. The rabbis went, well, maybe, you know, it's really not a good idea for people to be doing public lectures on the Merkava. This material is extremely sensitive in Jewish mystical tradition. Extremely sensitive. And you can see why it would be sensitive is because basically Ezekiel has an encounter where the divine chariot appears and he sees it. 
and he sees what it looks like and he sees her sitting on it. This is radically problematic for normative, monotheistic, incorporealized Jewish conceptions of God. Therefore, you have to force the text into various directions. It's very difficult to allegorize this. So the natural realm of the true interpretation of Ezekiel 1 has gone into the realm of mysticism. What does it really mean? It's not challenging to monotheism per se, but it's challenging to the unique type of monotheism that had developed within Jewish thought by this stage, which tended to assume that God doesn't have a body. But like I said, tended to assume. That position itself had not been definitively arrived at. But it's even more challenging because God is supposed to be kind of invisible yep, to the normal eyes of people. Here's where it's going to get interesting because I want to take a break in a few minutes because we need to take a break. But I do want to... Um, I do want to open the main subject now before we take the break, all right? And then we'll do it, and then I'll come back, and we'll talk about what we have to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. I haven't even... Everything I've said so far is simply by way of introduction. And I can tell you, and I can tell you, that if I spent the whole four-week series just on the topic I've got tonight, we would have what to talk about. So, I need to, to, I need to explain this to you. Merkava mysticism is an entire mystical tradition, what the authentic oral teachings that were transmitted about the cha Ezekiel chapter 1, that we only have glimpses of what it possibly contained. Yeah? We know what all of the other teachings on different parts of the Torah are, because if they're legalistic arguments, they ended up getting recorded in Talmudic literature. But we don't really necessarily know what it was that was being taught in relation to this, so we're glimpsing. But what we do have, emerging from the next few centuries, is a whole body of literature that scholars have spent the last couple of centuries uncovering because they have emerged, you know, through the various texts that have emerged from the ancient world and through the Kairogeniza and through various uh, identifications of texts within other texts and so on. We now have a fairly extensive body of literature called... Heichalot literature. This word Heichalot. So on the one hand, we have the word Merkava. What is the meaning of the word Merkava? What is the meaning of the word Merkava? Chariot. Chariot. So it's called, this entire thing is called Merkava mysticism that we're now aware of was a fully developed mystical thought system with Gnostic aspects prevalent within Jewish thought. And the literature that we have is called Heichalot mystic Heichalot literature. He Heichalot. What is the meaning of the word Heichal? What is the meaning of the word Heichal? Palace, temple. temple, chamber, palace. Yeah? Let's call it chamber. Now, it's the chamber literature. Because as we're going to see... What developed in Merkava mysticism were techniques and experiences of ascension. And before we take the break, and the thing that I need to tell you so that I can launch into this when we come back, is that there were a number of important texts in relation to Merkava mysticism. Certainly Ezekiel 1 was probably the primary, but there is another very, very short text. So short, in fact, it's only one sentence long. And it's in Genesis. And this became the basis of an entire theosophical and mystical literature and outlook that we find right throughout Merkava mysticism and I'll be coming back to talk about it after the break and that is and everything I've said till now will allow you to understand this in the we don't have Bibles here so I, I'll have to tell you well in Genesis chapter 5 verse 24 we learn about 
a series of genealogies. Yeah? Leading, f- leading from Adam to Noah. Right? There's another set of genealogies that's going to lead later on from Noah to Abraham. But this is the set of genealogies leading from, basically from Adam to the flood. Okay? And it's so-and-so is born and then he lives for a gadillion years and then he has this many gasquillion kids and then he dies and then the bada bada and they're all living long lives. Yep? Yeah, etc. Then it gets to a figure in verse 24. We get to a figure called Enoch. Hanoch in Hebrew. And the verse says... Vayit halech no chanoch. Enoch walked im ha Elohim or et ha Elohim with God. Ve'enenu, and then he wasn't. Ki lakachoto Elohim, because God took him. He didn't die. God took him. <coughs> It uses the same verb, lakach, God took him, as we find much later in the Bible by Elijah. So the mystics and the sages of Israel understood that something unique and mysterious happened to Enoch. And you don't learn this at Hebrew school every day, but what happened to Enoch was, and this is, not this is right across Jewish literature you will find this this is not an obscure point this is a known thing when I say known I, don't, I mean known to those who know is that Enoch ascended and was transformed into a fiery being who became ultimately the primary angel in the heavenly court by the name of Metatron. Now, some of you are sitting here going, I've never heard of Metatron. But Metatron is a kind of... I don't want to use the word intermediary, but there is a kind of very, very, very empowered angelic figure very empowered. The rabbis in the Talmud talk about this only in a couple of places. Kabbalistic literature talks about it. What is even more deep in that and things that people don't know is that Metatron itself is actually the transmogrified Enoch. We know about all this because of an extraordinary text called the Book of Enoch. Now, have a break. Uh, We will come back to that because Uh, most of the subsequent things we have to talk about in Merkava mysticism involve involve ascent to the higher chambers, how you do that, what happens there, and we need to understand that the figure of Metatron is actually Enoch. Enoch was taken by God before the flood. Remember, Enoch is Noah's great-grandfather. He's the father of Methuselah and he's Noah's great-grandfather. He was taken before the flood as to be a witness for subsequent eternity about the flood itself and what that generation was like and why God destroyed that entire generation. We're even told in the literature that when future generations come along and say, what sort of God is this? How could he destroy an entire world? There must have been innocents. There must have been children. There must have been animals. I mean, what what, what did they do? And Enoch exists as a witness to just how corrupt the entire planet had become during the generation of the flood and why God had to destroy it. But he goes on to become this exalted angel that figures in other parts of Jewish history and even the Bible. So, um, take a break. We'll need to come back. I have a lot of material to get through. All right. Who in this, who, who in this class just so I have an awareness of different levels of exposure to this type of material. Who has heard of Metatron? Metatron is the... Even aside from the association with Enoch, 
which the Association of Enoch, we now, I can now talk to you about that, but at one level in Jewish history and in Jewish thought, that was, there was a time, of course, in Jewish thought and history where the whole link between Metatron and Enoch was not, was considered one of the great mysteries and secrets of this particular type of tradition. And if you think about it, and maybe we'll get into this discussion a bit later if we have time, is that that entire idea is obviously a very big counterpoint to the Christian idea that was evolving around the same time that this mysticism is at its height. That is, that God effectively becomes, takes human form, whereas we have a human that is taken up, is taught, is trained, is purified, and becomes a quasi-divine figure. Metatron's status in the heavenly pleroma is so high that, as we will see, some people have mistaken him for God. And this was one of the dangers that accompanied certain ascents. But we'll look at that in a moment. Metatron is mentioned twice, two or three times in the Talmud. Uh, once in Hagiga 14a and once in Sanhedrin 38b. Uh, Metatron is mentioned ex throughout later Kabbalistic literature as well. The identity of Metatron. By the time you get to the Zohar, they got such an issue with Metatron that they even turn Metatron into the divine to save any issues and just say it's a divine representation at a lower level. It's a very, very, very tricky business, Metatron. But if you ask, if you just go home and type in, you know, and ask Rabbi Google uh, and say, okay, give me Metatron, you'll come across, a, you will have to wade through a whole lot of ooga booga on the fringes of the internet, but I'm assuming an intelligent person like yourself will be able to work out what is a sensible website, what is not. But there's a reasonable amount of material. It's just not something that's discussed in, you know, your average shul sermon. Now, yeah. Can you say something about the name? It's an unusual name. It is an extremely unusual name. We were just talking about before. And what's really interesting about the name is that scholars, and I'm talking today, uh, even with a tremendous renewed interest in Merkava mysticism of the last 20, 20 30 years amongst uh, uh, scholars in the field, uh, the ones who are really at the coalface playing through manuscripts and really working these things out, is that there is still a big discussion on the ultimate philology of the name Metatron. There are two basic ideas. One is that it comes from the Greek Metathronos, that is next to or behind the throne, and the, or beyond the throne, and the other is the Latin metator, which meant a guide. Uh, and in one of those ways, that word linguistically has come in, or, or, or it's something else entirely. Yeah? Some people argue that it didn't have a meaning, it was just a name that, you know, they came up with because angelic names uh, have so theurgic what, purpose. Sorry. How does that name come up, though? What's the, what's the what stage is the name Metatron? Where's it come from? The first, well, the, uh, the first time we kind of see Metatron is in the, uh, because some of the Talmudic mentions might actually be late. I don't want to get into too much detail here about that. No, 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 no. It's an excellent question. I just don't want to divert too much, but I'm going to answer that. But the first time we really see it is in the Book of Enoch. Now, there is a huge amount of detail I'm winnowing down here. And I don't want, I want you to realize what is the main thing I'm talking about, what is not the main thing I'm talking about. But let me just, in response to that, just let me bracket this for a minute so you don't get confused. Because when you go and you go, oh, Book of Enoch, right? You're going to find a huge veil of confusion if you don't listen to what I'm going to tell you now. Scholars are now aware of, and have been for most of the last century, of three separate books of Enoch, each of which are interrelated but represent different versions of it. Enoch 1, the book they call One Enoch, or the Ethiopic Enoch, we only have a full copy of in Ethiopian in Gez, which is the Ethiopian language, because for the Ethiopians, the Book of Enoch is a canonical text. 
It never became canonized within the Jewish tradition. But the Ethiopian, the Beta Yisrael and the uh, Falashmura that exist in Ethiopia, regard, they regard themselves as having the authentic tradition of Enoch. So for many, many years, we thought that the Book of Enoch was maybe, in the Ethiopian Book of Enoch was maybe, you know, a bit later, maybe the Ethiopians thought it was old, but it wasn't that old. And then what happened? Dead Sea Scrolls. We found excerpts, exact excerpts in the book of Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we know that that book in Hebrew and in Aramaic, so we know that that book of Enoch has some very, very old authenticity. The second book of Enoch is called the Slavonic book of Enoch. It's in Slavonic, but we're not, I'm not going into that now. What is of most critical importance, the, one, the book that I'm going to be drawing most of our sources, our discussion of this from, is called Three Enoch. And that is Hebrew. And that is the book that uh, became best known to us because it was kept and read and studied and handed down within the fringes of mainstream rabbinic Judaism. It emerges in mystical literature for the next hundreds of years. And we know of it and we have various editions of it. Uh, and it's been translated and so on, so that's Three Enoch. And I'll be discussing Three Enoch in some detail uh, about what is actually going on in Three Enoch. Can you set a rough date? So, oh, outstanding. Once again, good question. And <laughs> it would be very nice if I could hear and go, uh, say and go, nah, 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 nah. Shalom, Gershom Shalom, identifies Three Enoch at what he regards as the height of Merkava mysticism's development, which is actually fifth and sixth centuries CE in Babylonia not fifth, sixth centuries BCE in Babylon, don't get confused but a thousand years later, fifth, sixth century Babylonia, fifth, sixth century CE, that's at the end of the Talmudic period there are some theories that want to place Enoch post-Islam but that's generally not the consensus it's pre-Islamic and all of that Sufi ascent mysticism they probably got from us, not the other way around and I'm not saying that because of some form of nationalistic triumphalism, but because that looks like it's the case. Um, and so he places it there. Others want to say that the height of Merkava mysticism actually happens later in Babylonia. But it looks like, and what the big discussion is, is that, okay, 5th, 6th centuries, but it would appear to have earlier elements. We talk about a lot of Tanaitic and Mishnaic figures. So it would appear that this Merkava mysticism's elements were already existing in the 1st and 2nd century, so much earlier, and towards the end of the 2nd Temple period. But when I talk about elements, listen carefully, I'm not just talking about speculations and body of thought, I'm talking about a mystical practice. And that is what we're going to be discussing now. Merkava mysticism did not just, it evolved from teachings on the book of Ezekiel, but it didn't just stay at the level of what, of gnosis, of what we know, it became experiential. It became experiential. And the basic idea is, is that through meditative and practical techniques, the adept, meaning the person attempting this, ascends to the realm of the chariot. Those people who do that, and only the greater sages could do it, were called Yordei Merkava, Yordei Merkava, that means those who go down to the chariot. That's an amazing term for something that is called, that is actually an ascent technique, to go down to the chariot. But that is what it became known as. The chariot itself, and it's generally regarded within this mystical literature, is that the chariot that Ezekiel saw and the chariot that the person accesses is a chariot that is ridden by the divine as the divine shifts between realms. So the Garden of Eden to uh, the worlds of emanation to different parts of the divine plerima, there's this divine chariot. And as the divine moves to this divine chariot from the higher to the lower realms, one is able to access that and glimpse. But we'll get into more detail about that in a moment. 
how was this effected and what actually used to happen? And we know a lot of this because in 3 Enoch, 3 Enoch is a very famous account, famous in terms of the paradigm of this literature, and subsequently extremely influential. It is an account of one particular mystic who is very, very often identified with a lot of this literature. And I'm just going to talk for a minute about this, and we'll come back and I'll talk about him both uh, in a few minutes and also next week a little bit. And that is Rabbi Yishmael Ben Elisha. Anyone familiar with Rabbi Yishmael? Rabbi Yishmael was uh, probably the most famous contemporary of Rabbi Akiva in that many of the discussions in the Mishnah uh, between uh, points of disagreement between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael. And Rabbi Ishmael came from a very long line of high priests. So he himself was called Rabbi Ishmael Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Although, and I'm not getting into this in great detail, there is some ambiguity about him because it would appear he was a student of, Rabbi, of Nechunya ben Akana who lived towards the end of the Second Temple period. He's a contemporary of Rabbi Akiva who's really flourishing in the next generation and the generation after that. We know Rabbi Ishmael died in the Hadrianic persecutions in the 120s and 130s. So how he could have been a high priest at the end of the Temple is difficult to understand. Maybe he was a high priest as a young man or maybe the high priest was actually his father. But you have come across Rabbi Yishmael because those of you who have been to shul on um, Yom Kippur and have read in the liturgy the story of the Ten Martyrs will have come across him there. Rabbi Yishmael opens the book of Hanoch by describing his ascent and how he, well he doesn't describe his ascent in too much detail, we get that from a lot of other literature, but in the book of Enoch he goes up and he goes through the various levels that you need to go through and eventually he meets the transmogrified Enoch who takes him on this massive tour and explains to him how he became Metatron and all of that. It's a very, very extensive discussion. Uh, and it's, a, it's quite a large book. We also know from other texts such as the book of Hechalot. What are Hechalot? What are the chambers? I'll talk about that in a moment. Let me talk about first just the levels of preparation that these adepts required. First of all, there's a general restriction on the study of this material. You weren't allowed to really partake in this until you were at least 30. It goes without saying that... Well, 40 is a later thing. 40 is a later thing, and that's Kabbalistic, and that is a whole discussion behind that. But the general feeling here was that you had to be 30. Obviously, you had to be married. Obviously, you had to be extremely erudite already. You had to have studied everything. And everything means everything. You had to know the Bible completely well. You had to know the Midrash, you had to know all the oral law traditions, you had to know the Mishnah, and you had to be regarded as a sage. And not just intellectually, you had to be considered sagely, pious, and holy. Why did you have to be married? Let me, let me um, just address that for a second, because that's a good question. Why do you have to be married? Why do you think? In Jewish spirituality, Men are only complete when they're married to a woman. The individual alone is not considered a unit of spiritual perfection. That does not mean that single people can't reach tremendous heights, but they are not complete, considered complete. The Bible's very clear on it, the Talmud's very clear on it, and especially Jewish mystical literature is very clear on it. And even beyond Merkava mysticism, all Kabbalistic literature is very clear on it, if for no other reason than most Kabbalistic literature, and we're not discussing this today, this will be a, a, a later in the talk, is really, really, is, is incredibly expressed and grounded in sexual metaphor that would be very difficult for a non-married person to cope with. Do you also have to be male? Ah. 
that, that, in my view, with all due respect, is an even better question. Uh, did you have to be... Remember, but just on that last question, remember that Jewish spirituality has never, ever, ever seen sexuality or conjugal union in negative terms only in the highest holy terms. And therefore, if you're going to be a paragon of holiness, you have to be married. You have to have, you know, understood that you are in this world in a relationship with uh, a person of the opposite gender. Was it only available to men? We do not have records that I am aware of of women making the ascent. Perhaps part of the reason is because we only have very, very few examples of women who would have had the requisite knowledge and where even if a woman had the requisite knowledge and through various circumstances became a scholar, someone such as Bruria or something like that, and we've discussed that in the course on women, to find a teacher that would be willing to sit with them and teach them the teaching, the workings of the Merkava would be a very, very difficult thing. We don't have examples of women making the ascent. But there's nothing in the literature that says that a woman can't make the ascent. And I should point that out. Okay. So first of all, you have to be the right age, you have to be the right status. Then, if you're going to be one of the Yorde Merkava, and the literature is very clear on it, you have to make the correct preparations. And the preparations are extensive. All of the people that, I mean, not just Ishmael ben Elisha, but all of the others that describe this. And these apparently were real experiences. We're talking documented experience. But you had to be prepared. Now, some secular anthropologists who look at this material will say, absolutely, it's the very acts of all these preparations that will send you into this kind of mental ecstasy and illusion or whatever it is you're experiencing. But, whether and, and the discussion whether it's an illusion or whether it's real is something that you can have, you know, at another time. Where, as far as I'm concerned, I'm inside the literature now, so I'm, we're, we're assuming that the experiences they're having are real. First of all, the first thing that everybody talks about is uh, the notion of uh, fasting. Now, most of the texts indicate a preparation period, a minimum preparation period of 40 days. That does not mean you're fasting for 40 days, but a lot of those 40 days are fasts, and the fasts become even more intense in the last week. Most of them seem to indicate that for the week, for the seven days leading up to their actual ascent, in the last seven of those 40 days, they're fasting virtually every day. In fact, maybe they're even fasting for the entire week, right? So your body is already in a kind of altered state physically. Most of us know what it's like to come out of Yom Kippur and how quickly we rush home to have a biscuit or a sandwich or a drink of water. These people are going fasting for a week, but we know the human body can sustain that. Well, we know that without water it can do it. It's not, it's not what, what, what we regard as healthy. Your average GP is not going to recommend it, but um, it can survive. Uh, and maybe they were having water. Then there is the notion of purity. In one text I saw, uh, one of the adepts was uh, instructed that by one spiritual level that he accessed that if he wanted to go further he had to prepare himself again and he had to go to the mikvah 24 times a day so you're fasting and you're going in the mikvah right around the clock for several days when you're not doing that you are reciting various hymns that were prescribed for the adet and this would put you into an ecstatic meditative state. We still see these techniques by various shamanic tribes all around the world. This is not something that is unique to the Jewish experience in terms of the human experience of ascent uh, techniques, but it is uniquely Jewish. By the way, one of those hymns is still with us, amazingly. Who's familiar with the Siddur? You're familiar with the Siddur, right? Shacharit on Shabbat. Yeah? Before the Shema. El Adon al Kol Ma'asim. That's a Merkava text. It ended up in the liturgy. If you look at it and you read it, you'll see that very much. It's an alphabetic acrostic, and it's all about the Merkava. All right. 
So you would recite these, and sometimes you had to recite them 112 times in a row. Then, you're ready, and you need to sit down. The ascent was done in a seated form. Yeah, I'm going there. I mean, you have to realize that you're inducing, you really are inducing the ecstatic state by this recitation and by going to the mikvah and by the fasting. So you're already ethereal. Life. Yeah. And you are already, you are already a great sage and a holy person. This is, you know, and you're, you've done the preparations. And you, now, there was a particular physical position for all a sense. This is a position that we see also in later Kabbalistic revelations, but was developed in Merkava mysticism. I'm not going to try and do it. Obviously, it's got yogic implications, but they would sit, right, and they would drop their head between their knees. They would. They were, that was. That was. That was. That. That was the position, and it's a position that is a position of complete and abject humility on the one hand. But it also is apparently a physical position that is conducive to this kind of mental ascent. And then the realities would start to open up for you. And the first thing you needed to do was construct a vehicle that would take you up there. This vehicle is constructed of fire. And the way you construct it is by the recitation of particular divine names, all of which are listed in the literature. You recite the names, you visualize them, you recite them, you construct your vehicle. It has wheels, it has this, it's a vehicle. You can make yourself a Porsche, a Lamborghini, whatever you want over there, but probably most people just went with whatever looked basic enough. And then it would take you up. Now, that's just the beginning. But this is described again and again and again. You have to realize these are not people just simply... The, the, these techniques are not, con they were developed in the period of the Echalot literature and the Merkava mysticism, but they have been used subsequently. I can guarantee you that there are people in the last century also who've been trying their techniques, whether or not they have worked. But certainly throughout the Middle Ages, you know, a thousand years after these were developed, people were still trying them and writing their experiences. You ascend through various Heichalot, that is, you are going through various chambers. Everybody agrees on how many chambers there are. Seven. At every single chamber, there are guardian angels who are hostile. They don't want to let you in. You have to prove yourself and you have to have a certain seal on you. That seal, once again, is a particular divine name composed of a string of letters that you have memorized and that you present as a kind of a token to this angel so that they will begrudgingly allow you in and let you ascend to the higher level. Yeah? It's a bit like that Bruce Lee film, you know, um, was a game of death where he has to fight all the different seven levels going up the thing. Anyone see that movie? No? No one watches Bruce Lee movie? Okay. So, so, uh, you ascend. Now, the really, really, really tough one is chamber number six. Many people fail at chamber number six. There are various tests that are given to you along the way. And oi va voi if you fail those tests. On the one hand, you'll just get sent immediately out. That would be a good outcome if you fail the test. A bad outcome if you fail the test is that they kill you. People die if they make mistakes in this technique. Another reason why it's highly, highly dangerous. And yet people did it. Once you get, once the guardian angels of the sixth Pass you, you're allowed to move up to the highest chamber, which is the chamber where Metatron is sitting. And Metatron will then, because Metatron is awesome and terrible, but at the end of the day has a kind of benign affection for humans, having once been one, will take you and give you a guided tour of the chariot realm and you will behold the divine presence 
and that in itself is an experience that makes the entire thing worth it, apparently. You then are allowed to even partake in the divine service that is going on up in that chamber. In other words, you take on temporarily at least an angelic identity while you are up there and things are communicated to you. One of the things that you are doing on your ascent in one of the chambers, and apparently now we realize more and more why some of these sages were doing this, is that you get commitments from an angel called the Sar Torah, that is the prince or the minister of the Torah, who will download to you in spiritual enlightenment that would have taken you years to have otherwise acquired. So in some ways, this is a kind of a, a technique of gnosis. This is a technique of acquiring special knowledge in a way that you wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. And we, that may have actually been a motive for some of the rabbis to attempt these ascent techniques. Now, that's the basic framework. And then when you're ready, you come down through the chambers again and you come back and everything equals out. That's the idea. No one complains about the descent process. It happens, I believe, a lot quicker. And when you're ready, as soon as you're finished up there. Sorry? I just wonder if you actually see God while you're up there. So, you see the divine presence. You see the divine presence in a, in, a, in a way that is at the absolute limits of human perception and beyond what is uh, achievable here in any sense. Just seeing Metatron is usually enough for most people, but Metatron will take you into a place where they just say the they saw the divine presence and that drove them into kind of a, a, a oblivion. In a sense, there are two types. There are two types of ascent experience that scholars have identified in all this literature. One is the what we call the. It's a big word, but don't worry. One is called what we call the sonambulistic. Sonambulistic means that you are your consciousness is completely invested in what you're experiencing. It's not like you can communicate with anyone who's sitting around yeah it's not like if i went into sonambulistic ecstasy that you'd be able to say david what are you saying mm -hmm. right i'm there i'm completely and absolutely present there my entire consciousness has been taken over by the meditative experience of what i'm at of what's happening to me and the other type is what we call lucid and in a lucid ascent i can be observing this and I can be telling those sitting around me what I'm seeing. Yeah? And we have, everybody follow what, that distinction? And what we find is we have two different types of ascent theology that is emerging from that. Now that has very, very big implications because of whether you're going to do this by yourself or whether you're going to do this surrounded by others. The great sages of Israel, who's uh, Rabbi Nechunya ben Akana, Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha, and these rabbis, for the most part, did their ascent, did their ascents in groups, and they were for the most part lucid. That is, they were able to communicate with the audience at most points what was happening around them, and the people sitting around them would take notes. So are they all the same stories? Everyone has a different very, story. very similar very very similar and that's what's really interesting everybody who does these techniques and has these ascents has more or less similar experiences they're constructing a chariot they're going up through the chambers there are seven of them and they're in the highest chamber they meet metatron who takes them and shows them the divine presence have there been texts that they've read already about this one would assume that by the time this has been around for a few hundred years yes yes so they more or less because it's a technique it's a technique. So already they kind of know what to expect. So yes, it could be that they're looking for that and therefore they find it. But they're all very similar experiences. Now, some theories argue that 
I mean, the other, the, the other thing I want to talk about, just just mention, just before I get onto that, about what some people argue, but the, I want to talk about this concept. There's another strand that exists within this mysticism. It's like a substrand, and it has its own texts, and it's integrated into the wider Hechalot literature, and that is a strand of thought known as Shi'ur Koma. Sorry? Not Shi'ur, Shi'ur. What is Shi'ur? Not Shi'ur as in Shi'ur a class, but Shi'ur as in measurement. Yeah? Estimations of measurement. Koma is stature. The Shi'ur Koma literature deals with the dimensions of the divine. Just how big this structure is. That seemed also to be a product of the ecstatic trance. And what they're doing is they're, they're, they're developing numbers in terms of dimensions of how big the whole structure is, which seems to be filled with millions and millions of angels comprising this massive structure. And, uh, you know, just the, 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 they'll talk about things that are millions of parasangs long and then tell you that that's just one unit that is one small part. And when you expand all the fractions, it reaches up into infinity. But this seemed to be a part of... But what, what is int- of, of the ecstatic um, experience... But what we learn from Shil Koma is that they are, in a sense, witnessing or visualizing or looking at something that does have corporeal dimensions. Everything is about what they're witnessing. There is no imminence here. I want to stress that. This is a very different thing from much, much later you know, if we go forward 2,000 years ago, the Hasidic movement of the 18th century, and people are running around going, oh, the Pintal Yid, God is in me. Yeah? This is not imminence, God is in the world. No. This is absolute transcendence. They are witnessing transcendence. They are witnessing something overwhelming, infinite and beyond um, their ability to fully apprehend. They're just... Yeah? They are, in a sense, their minds are becoming drowned with the, with the uh, magnitude of the divine. Now, and there is a special book called Shi'ur Koma, which is part of the Hechalot literature. It's generally treated separately, but it deals with these issues of dimension. Now, some people argue that a lot of this mysticism developed, and I realize I've got 15 minutes now to discuss some of the most complex and interesting material, but I'm going to have to get through it. Some people argue that this kind of Merkava mysticism developed around the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. As you know, those of you who've studied history, any history will know, cataclysmic cataclysmic events can shift the theological workings of people and entire cultures and as a result of these cataclysms things develop particularly certain mystical approaches one of the most famous of the Sefer Hechalot literature is in fact the ascent of Rabbi Yishmol ben Elisha's teacher Rabbi Nechunya ben Akana Rabbi Nechunya ben Akana very very famous mystic of the late, late Second Temple period. And they had a spiritual apprehension that something really, really bad was about to happen. Something really bad was about to happen, of course. The Romans were about to destroy Jerusalem and the Temple. And so they decided to make some inquiries upstairs. And they sent, and Rabbi Nechunya ben Akana did an official ascent with all the preparations. He was the greatest mystic of his age. He's the one that had taught most of the generation these traditions. And he, surrounded by all of these sages, made this incredible descent. This is possibly one of the most remarkable, lucid accounts of an ascent because he remained lucid the entire time. He couldn't respond to everything, but he was talking while he was there. I'm seeing this. I'm seeing this. I'm seeing that. This is what's happening to me. And they're all sitting around and they're all taking notes, including his foremost student in mysticism, 
Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha. Most of these sages were of the students of Rochanan ben Zakkai, who lived in the last generation of the Second Temple. And at one point, he says, and this I'm, I'm mentioning this, this is super, super interesting. At one point, he says the following statement when he is in the sixth chamber and he's talking to the angel of the sixth chamber. And the angel of the sixth chamber is telling him that his job is to kill those who descend to the chariot and those who don't descend to the chariot. So the rabbis listening to this are going, what does that mean? What does that mean? He's killing people who go to, into the chariot, people who don't go into the chariot? Ask him what it means. So they ask him. But by this stage, Nechoni bin Akana is moving from the sixth to the seventh chamber, and he's not in a position to communicate with them more about what the meaning of what was said to him. So they said, bring him back. We want to ask him what that means. So they go, how do we bring him back? Right? And they describe the technique of bringing him back when they had to bring him back. And it, Rabbi Akiva actually was involved in this technique because he was there. Rabbi Akiva, later on, we're going to find out, is one of the great mystics, or one, adept, one of the great adepts of the mystical ascent theology. They bring him back to their technique. Now, I'm going to describe this technique only because it's fascinating from an anthropological point of view, but I'm not going to open up on a myriad of questions of this, okay? Some of you are going... <laughs> so, I know, some of you are going to, But this is what they did. They took a cloth... A very soft cloth made of feather down. And they brought this cloth to a woman who had just immersed in a mikvah after her menstrual cycle. Yep, yeah? so she was pure. But there was a question about her immersion that would have been sufficient question for them to have asked the rabbis whether or not she had done a valid immersion. That question, had it been asked, would have been answered by the majority of rabbis in the affirmative that the mikvah and the, uh, the immersion had been acceptable and that she was pure. But a majority of them, not all of them. They then got this woman to touch very very lightly with her index finger one very small part of this cloth and they said to her as though you were removing a lint from your eye that's how delicately you touch it she just touched it they took that cloth and they just with the edge of it touched Rabbi Luchun Yubilakana and that was sufficient to have him immediately dismissed from the seventh chamber and he's away no, it's not the evils of women. It's the it's 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 amazing because the level of purity you had to be at. This is a woman that, by the majority of all the great sages of Israel, would have been so pure she would have been totally permitted to her husband. But because it would only a majority would have said, therefore it was and just that it was it, at that level the level of purity. That, but it was a whole formula. They're writing great deal about how they brought him back. So they said to him. What did it mean when they said to you, we, I kill the ones who go into the Merkava, I kill the ones who don't go into the Merkava? And he said, he's referring to the people that are sitting around me. You. You have to be very careful. He couldn't, wouldn't just kill me. He'd kill everyone that was around watching me and taking notes and who I was talking to. And they went, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Quite a remarkable account there. And if you want to get the Hechalot literature, a lot of it in the last 20, 30 years has now been translated. These are phenomenal ascent experiences that at the time of the 5th and 6th centuries were the main form of Jewish mysticism and still were influential hundreds of years later because we see them emerging in the Hasidei Ashkenaz. We'll talk about this later in, in, uh, in Germany, in the Middle Ages. We see it in Spanish Kabbalah, in the Zohar. We see it in many uh, later strands. And still, even till now, references to aspects and themes within Merkava mysticism, the workings of the Merkava. Now, I've now got exactly seven minutes to discuss the most famous of the ascents. <laughs> the most famous of the ascents, so stay with me because I'm going to have to discuss this very intently 
and we'll continue discussion on this next week if you want, but this is a very, very important. Who is familiar with the very, very, very famous story from Masechet Chagiga in the Talmud? Uh, and some of you are sitting there going, oh, he said the Talmud, I'm not going to be familiar with that. But nevertheless, you may still be familiar with it, but its origin is in not just the Talmud. Most people think its origin is the Talmud, but its origin is actually in Merkava, mysticism in Sefer Echalot, and it found its way into the Talmud about the four rabbis who ascended to the Pardes. In the Talmud, in Masechet Chagiga, in the most famous mystical passage of the whole Talmud, it refers to four rabbis who ascended, you're nodding your head, so you know it, who ascended into the orchard. The orchard meaning the divine orchard. It uses the term pardes, meaning an orchard. It's a learn, Persian loan word, but it became Hebrew. Meaning they underwent an ascent together. These rabbis were a great, and you can see these rabbis, if you study Perkei Avot, if you study the Ethics of the Fathers, which is, which is a Mishnaic tractate, you can see these Mishnaic rabbis. This is, these are all second century rabbis. Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Elisha Ben Avuya, and Rabbi Akiva. And they all underwent the ascent together. Just before they made the ascent, Rabbi Akiva warned them of the great water test. The texts talk about the water text. The water test. The water test is, is that in one of the chambers, the angels will send waves and waves at you of what looks like water. You have to withstand that and you cannot believe that it's water because it's not water. If you say or think for a second this is water, you're gone. Because you, this is because in the room of in the realm of truth, there is no space for any falsehood whatsoever. Anyone seen the film Dune? Where he puts his hands in that box. Yeah, it's a bit, it was a bit like that, right? It's water. So Rabbi Akiva warns them, when you get to the place of pure marble, don't say mayim, mayim. Don't say water, water. Now, Benazai couldn't pass that. Which Benazai? One of the great sages of the Mishnah. Couldn't do it. <coughs> killed. What it meant killed is that his mind, his soul, just expired in pure ecstasy. They killed him, but they killed him in a... a nice way. It, well, he just got absorbed. He didn't come back. He didn't come back. There are a lot, every single, there are literally thousands of pages of commentary on every single word in the famous Ascent story in Masechet Hagiga. It's the most famous mystical story in Jewish literature. Ben Zoma also <coughs> struggled with the water test and went mad lost his mind he came back they sent him back but he was never the same again went with sugar Elisha Benavuya got through the water test but had a major cataclysm happen to him in the seventh chamber because in the seventh chamber he saw Metatron <laughs> who was given permission to sit down to write the merits of Israel, and he goes, what's he doing sitting down up here? You know what? I think there are two powers going on here. There's God and there's Metatron. He suffered a theological prolapse. <laughs> I've never used that term. But it, and, and, he, and, and, and he believed in a Gnostic dualism and came out and immediately lost his faith. The Talmud describes this in great detail. The first thing he did, this is an incredibly holy, righteous sage that's mentioned in the Mishnah. He goes, and the first thing he does, he goes to a prostitute. And she goes, what are you talking about? You're Elisha Belavuya. And he goes, am I? And he picks a flower on Shabbat and gives it to her. 
And she goes, nah, you are someone else. You are Acher. And so always afterwards he became known as Acher, another one. And the fourth Rabbi Akiva, it says, Nichnas b'shalom, v'yatsa b'shalom. Rabbi Akiva was the only one that had sufficient spiritual balance to be able to go in and come out unharmed. This is a massive story, and it's already quarter two, and I have things about that that we could discuss. Have a look at the four who ascended to Pardes in your, in, in your own research, and I'm sure that you will come back with many, many ideas about it as well. But it is the most famous example of an ascent story that has made its way into the Talmud proper. Everything else we have discussed is on the margins. Your average shul rabbi will not know about Enoch and Metatron and the Hechalot and the Chambers and the Ascent. These are all sublimated elements within Jewish thought, but they are still with us and they are still studied by people involved in those types of experiences. I'm sorry that I did not get in to talk about the problems of Acher and Metatron. By the way, by the way, as a result of Acher's apostasy, as a result of Acher's apostasy, Metatron was taken and given 60 lashes of fire as a result of the fact that... But, I mean, he was given permission to sit. It wasn't his fault that Acher lost the theological perspective. And Metatron later tells Ishmael ben Elisha on a subsequent uh, ascent that it didn't hurt. It was just for show. And uh, we'll continue on another part of the uh, mystical adventure of Jewish thought. <laughs> Thank you for listening. To find out more about David Solomon's books, recordings and classes, or to support his work and teachings for just a few dollars a month, visit davidsolomon.online.